Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be with you this morning. It's always great to get together with the patients that we are working with, usually one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but to see them together in such a large group. And we were talking this morning as I signed in about the first such patient group in Canada, which was in Kingston. It was a small meeting. It was 2003. And it was something that took place in part because we had a registry in Canada, a list of names and addresses of people who were affected by Alpha-1, and we were able to help the community get together. So this morning, it's seeing that community in action, and it's very heartening. You have to watch out for me. I'm an academic, so I come with slides, graphs, p-values, um, never a good thing, but I will try my utmost to speak in plain English, which is a challenge, but, but bear with me. I'll, I'll do my very best. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the research in Alpha-1. Some of it you may know about. Some of it you may not know about. I'm also going to talk about COPD in general. And I hope by the end of the talk I'll have told you one or two things you haven't heard before and offer you one or two thoughts about your own relationship to Alpha and your own disease management if you're affected by the problem. Bear with me. Routinely these days when folks like me give talks, we always declare our conflicts, which is to say that I've done consultations with, research sponsored by, and lectures in venues put together by a number of dodgy commercial entities. <laughs> Watch out for what I say, I, or it means that I have so many conflicts I have none left at all. So here's what we'll talk about, I hope, and I'll uh, talk about this as quickly as I can so we have time for Q&A. I want to back up a little bit from the specific kind of emphysema we're going to spend some time talking about today and talk about COPD. I know you know what that is, but chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. I want to talk about its epidemiology. It's kind of important to alpha-1 communities. I'll talk about alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in Canada. The word there that you can focus on is Canada. I want to tell you a little bit about our history in this country. Uh, we're privileged, not giving anything away here, to have uh, some visitors, including my colleague Sandy Sandhouse, who can tell you a great deal about the US and global history of Alpha-1. But I want to tell you something special about the history of Alpha-1 in Canada. We'll talk about COPD treatment. Um, it's been evolving. There are some new things out there. You might want to give them some thought. We'll talk, of course, about augmentation therapy. I'll give you a quick survey, including some updated analyses. And then at the end, get your pen and pencils ready. I have some recommendations for you about what to do with this information. So some caveats. I'm just talking, for the most part, when I talk about alpha-1 treatment, about the intravenous treatment for lung disease. Uh, I'm not talking about liver disease. Good thing is that's in the program a little bit later. And there's only one augmentation therapy uh, product available in Canada. Generally speaking, the other ones that are available in the world, including the US, we think are pretty similar. So we'll tend to speak in generic terms about augmentation therapy, even though some of the research was done by different uh, products. And um, not everybody's alpha one is the same. So I have some thoughts for you, some general recommendations, but at the end of the day, Anything you take away from here, you need to review with your own doctor who should know the details of what's going on with you and your lungs and your alpha-1. By the way, there was a slight advancer up here earlier today and it seems to have disappeared. If somebody has it in their pocket, it would be great if you could volunteer it. I can hit the wrong button and delete all the slides any moment now. So the evolving epidemiology of COPD. Epidemiology is a boring word, but I think this is an interesting story, which tells you what sort of an academic nerd I am. This is a slide that I love to use. This is a slide that talks about something pivotal that happened in the last century. Some of you in the room will remember that last century. And what I'm talking about is something that's documented here from American data. Bear with me. I'm going to show you Canadian data in a second. And it's a tracing of what happens to some common diseases 
deaths from those common diseases, and these are diseases that are related to tobacco smoking. So 1965 to 1998, that's the period we're looking at. And we know, for example, coronary heart disease, as it's labeled over there on the far left, that's related to tobacco smoking. Why are we interested in that time period? Well, now I'm talking to the folks in the room who don't have as much gray hair as I do. You're going to have to know that 1965 was one year after something really important. In 1964, the U.S. Surgeon General said to the public at large, tobacco smoking causes lung cancer and lots of other really bad stuff. So again, for those of you who don't have as much gray hair as I do, you're going to have to picture an episode of Mad Men. In 1964, 50% of the adult North American population smoked. And so they were smoking everywhere. They were smoking in restaurants, in doctor's offices. They were smoking in cars. They were smoking in elevators. But by now, only about 15% of the adult North American population is smoking. And a lot of that decline happened during the period we're about to look at. So, left-hand column. Coronary heart disease, a cause of death related to tobacco smoking. What happens? Mortality is on the decline, about 60%. Stroke is the next one over, down about 60%. Other stroke-like things, down about 30%. I'm going to jump past COPD. I've learned to do that for dramatic effect. And all-cause mortality is leveled or down a little bit. So what happened to COPD as a cause of death? It should be going, but it didn't. It went up 163%. Why is that? And I'll teach you something a lot of doctors don't seem to recognize. The damage to the lungs from tobacco smoke, if it's damage that we call COPD, is pretty permanent or persistent. We can change it, influence it, produce some benefit with our treatments, but at the end of the day, the lungs that were eaten away prematurely from tobacco smoke in the middle of the 20th century are persisting. And there's no way around it. And of course, the population's aging. Now, I tell you all of this because COPD is a pretty important disease. And yet, it doesn't seem to be getting a lot of attention. Let me come back to that. I promised you Canadian data, so here it is. It's not as pretty. There's a Health Canada graph. And if you can't read the x-axis, we still haven't found that pointer. Check the shelf Why didn't somebody shout that earlier? You were just <laughs> waiting for me to. I'm going to go back to the beginning of my talk and do it now with a pointer. If you look at the beginning of this x-axis, it starts at 1950. It brings us to 2010. And Health Canada says that's a graph of mortality from COPD in this country, and it's rising. Two lines. And you would probably guess that it's men and women. And you'd probably guess that way out in front, losing their lives more often are men. But I hope you noticed at the end of the graph, around the turn of the millennium, the lines crossed. And what that said was women were now being affected more often by COPD than men and were losing their lives to this disease more often than men. And something the Lung Association hasn't been using as much as I think they should is this little factoid that this year in Canada and the year before and the year before and the year before and the year before and the year before, more women lost their lives to COPD than lost their lives to breast cancer. Let me quickly add, and I always do this with medical audiences, this isn't a case of my saying, and so COPD is more important. At least that really shouldn't be the message. Think about breast cancer for a minute. Have you ever seen an ad, um, a walk, a run, an event that was held to raise awareness of breast cancer? Do we really need to raise awareness anymore about breast cancer? It's a great job that's been done. And you ask family doctors about screening for breast cancer, and they'll tell you when they'll start mammography and when they'll stop doing mammography and about self-examinations and all kinds of things. They know about that stuff. 
ask a family doctor about screening for COPD, and you'll probably get one of these. So I'm going to challenge doctors to start learning about COPD. Let me bring it back to the Alpha-1 community. Here's a problem that you face. This little graph floated around the Twitterverse a couple of years ago, and it just fascinated me. I don't know that you can read the coding to it, but it talks about, and again, these are American data, money that's been raised by charities for medical problems. And then it talks over on the right about the number of deaths in that country due to those diseases. This big pink blob, you could probably guess what that is. That's breast cancer. A lot of money gets raised to deal with this problem. Cancer's a scary word. How many deaths? There. This little purple blob is how much money gets raised to deal with COPD and lung diseases in general. Whoops, sorry. This little blue bot is the one I wanted you to see. And that's deaths due to COPD in the United States. There's a tremendous disproportion between where we put our resources and where we need our resources. And this is something you need to think about because I know a great many of you want the government to pay a bit more attention to the disease you've got, perhaps in terms of funding augmentation therapy. And one of the issues is our funding for things medical is emotionally driven. It's not driven by facts. Your disease and COPD in general needs a whole lot more attention than it's getting. And you need to be equipped with these facts. You need to address some of these emotional things and bring that forward to the politicians who are making some of these decisions. Let me move on to Alpha-1 specifically. And you're going to hear lots more about Alpha-1 today. So I will tell you a little bit about Alpha-1 in Canada, a little bit of background. Um, my slide's a little garbled, so I'll just say that in 1963, Laurel and Ericsson in Sweden described this deficiency of a blood protein that they eventually realized was produced in the liver and was necessary to protect the lungs. What did it protect the lungs from? Over on the left, somebody who'd studied anatomy would say, that looks like normal spongy lung, a nice dense sponge. And that's where blood and oxygen can somehow commingle for our benefit. But over on the right, that loose, less dense sponge, that's lung that's been eaten away by an excess of, we call them proteases or elastases, normal body substances, but allowed to run unchecked in the lung and to cause damage. It was half a century ago that Lorella and Erickson described it. A little more than a quarter of a century ago, some scientists working in the NIH and elsewhere purified alpha-1 antitrypsin protein and discovered they could infuse it. They could infuse it once a week, and they could produce some blood levels that weren't quite normal, but they thought were protective. You're looking at one of those graphs that scientists like to look at. This one appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. On the y-axis, we have serum levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin. And we have across the x-axis number of days. So you're looking at four infusions once a week over the course of a month. Of course, with an infusion of this purified blood protein that people don't seem to have enough of, you get a very high blood level. But the body begins to chew it up the levels drop, but you notice that by the end of the week, they haven't dropped all the way back to their baseline. In fact, they stay above this little dashed line. It's labeled on this graph as threshold, and that's thought to be the protective threshold. By the way, we're not so sure anymore, and we'll come back to this, that that threshold is the protective threshold, but it seemed like the protective threshold at the time these studies were done. So. Based on these findings, blood measurements, we can boost blood levels of alpha-1, also based on finding it in samples washed out of the lungs. Health Canada, the FDA, some European regulatory authorities said, 
we will approve the prescription use of this purified protein. Let's talk about Canada now. In 1989, the Canadian Thoracic Society got together. Two or three individuals reviewed the data and they said, well, you know, those blood levels are all well and good, but we're lung doctors and we like lung measurements. So we think we need to see that lung measurements, lung function, is preserved by this intravenous treatment. So our bottom line is, before doctors use this, we need further research. What resulted is a very different experience in Canada as compared to our neighbors to the south, where pulmonary doctors began to look for alpha-1, began to prescribe augmentation therapy, this intravenous therapy, and believed in the importance of this therapy. It was also very much in contrast to Germany. So the last time I had a look at any of the numbers, the Canadian use of alpha-1 antitrypsin augmentation therapy was about one-tenth of that as compared to our neighbors to the south. As a result, Canadian lung specialists have actually spent very little time thinking about this disease, learning about it, and you might be surprised to know, or maybe you figured this out already, a lot of lung doctors out there in the community really can't answer your questions about this disorder. Now remember, what doctors wanted at the time was spirometry. Everybody in the room, I suspect, with a lung problem has had this. A simple five or ten minute measurement, repeated forceful blowing into the device. We do like this measurement. It's pretty well understood. It's pretty robust. Well, the t study that the Canadian Thoracic Society wanted also looks pretty simple. They said, let's find people with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. We like randomized controls, which sounds confused, but you know what I mean. Half the patients get a treatment, half the patients don't. And you keep track over a period of time. Pretty simple. Augmentation therapy or fake stuff. Problem is when you start to actually put some numbers to this, add some details to this study, you discover that you need to track people for a long time. Even in alpha-1, the lungs are not changing rapidly. <clears throat> Five years is most people's estimate of how long this trial should take. And uh, it takes a lot of people in each treatment arm. If you add it up, it's about 1,000 people. Well, I am here to tell you today, in 1989, nobody had 1,000 alpha-1 patients to study. And for that matter, in 2017, nobody really has 1,000 patients, certainly not in any one place. And so the closest I can come is our largest published randomized control trial to date. It was called the RAPID trial. And if you haven't seen this before, you can find clinical trials registered, even before they're completed, on a website called clinicaltrials.gov. And this trial, the RAPID trial in alpha-1 treatment, augmentation treatment, was is now completed, it was registered in 2005. That's when everybody said, okay, here it is, here's our protocol, this is what we're gonna do. They started to recruit people and they didn't finish until 2012, seven whole years. It took seven years to do this trial. Was it 1,000 patients, 500 patients? It wasn't even 200, it was 180 patients. It took 24 international sites to do this it hit just about all continents. I think we skipped Antarctica. And again, it took seven years. The intervention wasn't a five-year intervention. It was two years. How do we do that? We did that by measuring lung density. Now, the good news, all of this effort, all of this additional study has prompted the Canadian Thoracic Society to reconsider things. So I'll just flash up there a headline. Don't have to worry about reading it. I'll pull out this part. The Canadian Thoracic Society now says about intravenous treatment, not that it's a research intervention. It says, you know what, if somebody's FEV1 is impaired, if it's between 25 to 80 percent of what it should be, doctors should be considering this because it preserves lung density, the sponginess of the lung, and actually because there's some evidence that people live longer when they get this treatment. So the RAPID trial, if you wanted to go look it up, is published in Lancet 2015. 
it's still relatively current. And the idea behind RAPID is that we can measure lung density, the sponginess, with an X-ray. Now, what you're looking at on this graph is lung density. Up is good. Down means we're losing lung density. And what I'm going to show you is the first 24 months, the first two years of RAPID, there was a, an extension that I'll tell you about in a second. There's a loss of lung density. Now, before you're alarmed, I'll tell you that it happens with everyone. It happens with aging. But here's what happened to people who were receiving placebo, no intravenous augmentation in the RAPID trial, and this is what happened to people who received augmentation. The rate of lung density loss, the rate of lung sponginess was slowed down. And we thought that was an important difference. That's a difference, a 33% reduction. Now, in the next 24 months, as it turns out, everybody got active treatment. In other words, these people who'd been getting the treatment, they continued. These folks, they now started. And what you see is the people who continue don't really change their course. The people who start now have a slowing in their loss of lung density. Their rate of lung density loss really is about the same as the people who started early. But you'll also notice that there was no catch up. This line never crosses this line. The folks who lost some lung function by using placebo for two years never really caught up. So our message to doctors about this study is when you're thinking about starting augmentation therapy, if you can, start it early. There are a couple of other things, and this might be more of interest to, uh, to, to doctors who prescribe augmentation therapy, but what you're looking at across here would be the blood levels that are measured during the treatment, and across here is the protective effect on lung density. Now, it's an odd thing to say, but there's some evidence of what doctors call a dose response. In other words, the more treatment you get, the better the result. And I say that's odd because there was only one standard dosage of intravenous treatment. Doctors who deal with alpha-1 know what that dosage is. It's 60 milligrams per kilogram per week. But depending on whether you're fat or lean, the resulting blood levels are a little bit variable. And when we modeled it out, it looked as though the more your blood level rose with treatment, the more protection you got. And that's resulted in some ongoing studies where we're now looking at higher doses of intravenous treatment. That's what I meant before when I said we weren't sure about our dosing in that original threshold, and we're starting to think that more is better. By the way, just before I forget to say this, here's something very practical that I'm now trying to check and remember to check with all of my patients, doctors calculate the dosage of intravenous treatment based on your weight. I don't have to tell you that we seldom come up with a nice round number like 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000. What that means is if the nurse or whoever gives you your intravenous treatment, gives you your exact dose, there's going to be some left over in the vial. The vials come in 1,000 milligram amounts. I think in the past, some of that vial got tossed out. Please make sure that doesn't happen. More is better. And your doctor, when writing a prescription, should always round up. If the calculated amount for your infusion is 4,200 milligrams every week, you should get the full 5,000 that comes in that vial. Doctors still love FEV1. It's a quarter century later, and I talk to lung doctors, and sometimes when they look at the rapid trial results, they go, CT scan lung density? That's an x-ray. I don't treat x-rays. I like my spirometry. So the good news is we've now published, it's in Lancet Respiratory Medicine, the fact that changes in lung density and changes in that familiar spirometry are actually moving in the same direction. And it took four whole years of the RAPID trial to see that. 
the rapid trial lung density measurements were evident at two years. Spirometry is kind of slow and fuzzy, but we saw that the protection in lung density on the y-axis, changes in FEV1 on the x-axis are actually associated. We can actually put some numbers to it. Doctors aren't used to dealing in these terms, but for every three grams per liter loss of lung tissue, we're expecting a 10% change in FEV1. Until a couple of years ago, we couldn't say that to doctors. And now we can say it's not just treating x-ray changes, it's treating the measurements that you use every day in the clinic. Let's bring it back home and we'll talk about what this means to patients. What does it mean if your lung density is better preserved? Well, here's what we noticed in our trial. There were some people of that 180 who didn't finish out the trial, they passed away, and there were some people who got to be so bad that they got transplanted. The average lung density that people started at was 46 grams per liter. The average time when somebody either passed away or got a transplant was down here, it was about 20 grams per liter. And then we looked at what happened, the rate of lung density loss, it's about 2.26 grams per liter per year. And then we looked at the result of intravenous treatment. That slowed down the loss. And what we're looking at there is an average years of life gained. It's just about six years of life gained for the average patient in the rapid trial if this treatment had been continued. I want to back up a little bit to COPD, say a few things about that, and then we'll wrap up and let some of the um, other presentations happen. If I lecture about COPD, I am obligated, um, it's a promise we all make, to share the official guidelines. So brace yourselves, I'm going to show you the Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines for the management of COPD. There they are. And take your notes now. <laughs> yeah, doctors don't like it much either. This is the usual response I get when I show these guidelines. Oh my God. And in truth, those are complicated guidelines with arrows and acronyms. And so doctors have tended to simplify things. They say, well, if I'm dealing with COPD, let me give a puffer that I know the name of that's supposed to be good for COPD. And for a long time, there was one that was an anticholinergic airway opener called Spireva. And then patients would come back and say, well, it's not bad, but you know, I still get a little winded when I walk up a hill. And then doctors would add something else. They'd say, well, let me give you this Advair or this Symbacort. Bang, bang, two visits. And people would be on what we call triple therapy because Advair and Symbacort are dual medicines that contain an inhaled steroid and another different kind of airway opener called a beta agonist. I'll bet you there are lots of people in this room who have been on that combination, Spireva and Advair, Spireva and Simbacort. It's um, something we're moving away from. <clears throat> and what we're moving towards in general terms in the COPD field, not specifically the alpha field, is the dual bronchodilator foundation. I'll show you what I mean. Doctors, again, love to measure FEV1. This graph is from a large trial measuring FEV1 first thing in the morning, pre-dose FEV1. And I think as people in this room well know, breathing function FEV1 is at its lowest first thing in the morning when people wake up. That's, by the way, true whether you're normal or have COPD or have asthma. Lowest numbers are always first thing in the morning. And what you're seeing in this trial that lasts for 64 whole weeks is the result of the traditional one drug treatment, the bronchodilator or airway opener treatment, Spireva, that's in green, or one of the newer agents, also once daily, called Cebri or glycoperonium. Lung function goes up as soon as it's given, and every day, every week that it's measured over the course of 64 weeks, the lung function is a bit better. But if you decide to give an inhalation that contains not only the anticholinergic like a peronium, but this other flavor of airway opener, a beta agonist, this one's called indicatorol, you get a better result. Doctors love better results. They love better numbers. 
does this make any difference to patients who are actually inhaling this stuff? And the answer is yeah. There's this problem of exacerbations. You might call it a bout of bronchitis, a worsening. It's when you have to go to the walk-in clinic or, heaven forbid, the emergency room and get an antibiotic, maybe some prednisone. Here's the rate at which it happens with either of the single agent treatments, teotropium or glycopuronium. Here's the lower rate of exacerbations with the additional airway opener. So more and more we're using two agents, and you might say, well, what happened with the inhaled steroids? And the truth is we've discovered that inhaled steroids don't help much with day-to-day -day symptoms. They don't help much with breathlessness. They slightly reduce the tendency to flare-ups, bouts of bronchitis. And we know that some of our patients have an element of asthma, twitchy airways, and so we might use inhaled steroids then. And I say, okay, well, that sounds like a good argument for triple therapy. I don't like getting sick. Any reason not to use the inhaled steroids? And the answer is, yeah, actually there are. For example, relative to your daily dosage of inhaled steroid, your risk of having a fracture increases. Those are data from COPD patients. Here's some of the latest data looking at pneumonia. Turns out if you use inhaled steroids for COPD, your risk of having infections of various sorts, including pneumonia, is increased. This is a bronchodilator alone, no inhaled steroid. It's called Volantarol. And it's compared to one, two, three different formulations of Volantrol with some inhaled steroid mixed in. And you can see the rate of pneumonia is just about doubled in this very, very large trial. So you might say, is any other way I can reduce my risk of flare-ups? And it turns out there are a whole lot of things. And I suspect you know most of these. If not, please take note. Avoid exposures. Um, if you have kids and grandchildren that get together and share their viruses with you at Thanksgiving and Christmas, watch out for that. And sometimes you might just have to stay away or encourage the grandkids to stay away. Hand washing. We're finally teaching doctors to wash hands. You should be doing it too. That does reduce the risk of sharing infections. Pulmonary rehab seems to reduce the risk of hospitalization due to exacerbation. Vaccinations, of course, your flu shot, that's out there. Now you can get it at the drugstore. It should be relatively easy. Inhaled steroids I've mentioned, not for everyone. And then there are a couple of things that I'll mention quickly, roflumilast and antibiotics. For a long, long time, we've said, save antibiotics for when you really need them. So for COPD patients, that means when you've got a flare-up. But we've realized that some people who have lots and lots and lots of flare-ups, we might be better off just giving them some regular antibiotic. And a lot of us now do this Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, at least during the at-risk season. This was the original trial that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine. This graph looks at people who are remaining free of exacerbation. So you can see in this population, over the course of a year, 70% of the folks are having a flare-up when they're taking placebo tablets. But if they took the antibiotic that's called azithromycin, there's actually a reduction. Not a huge reduction, doesn't abolish the problem, but a reduction in the tendency to exacerbation. So we're doing this cautiously in some of our patients. And then there's this stuff called roflumilast, or brand name Daxis. It's a pill, it's not an antibiotic, it's not a steroid. But in some patients who have lots and lots of flare-ups, and you can see the groups are divided in various ways here, but no matter how you slice the numbers, the folks who get this pill, if they can tolerate it, have fewer exacerbations. Now, let me quickly add, we're here in Toronto and Ontario. The government, in its wisdom, has decided not to pay for this in the drug benefit formulary, so you either need to pay for it yourself out of your own pocket or have an insurance plan that would cover it. The other big problem though is this pill, as good as it may be at reducing flare-ups, also tends to upset stomachs and give some people diarrhea. So I would guess that about half the people we try to use it in don't tolerate it. And other people are just fine. It's something you don't really know until you try it. Finally, something really, really important to take away with you when the inevitable happens. You can wash your hands, you can banish the grandchildren to wherever, you can do all the right things, inhale your medicine regularly, and you might still get a flare-up. 
So what do you do when you have a flare-up? Well, there was an interesting study, and this is a Canadian study. We should be proud, Jean Bourbeau and his colleagues working out of Montreal and elsewhere said, let's take people who have exacerbations of COPD. They've just left the hospital. We're going to give them usual care, good care at the time, good conscientious family doctor or lung specialist to talk to. And some of those folks were going to give some self-management tools. And all they meant was there at home in the medicine cabinet would be an antibiotic and prednisone and the phone number of a nurse to call. So that if there was cough and phlegm and some breathlessness and it lasted more than a day, they could call and say, is this when I'm supposed to use my medicine? And people could do that. And I think you're seeing the results here. The folks who had the self-management skills over the next year, 40% fewer hospitalizations due to their lung disease, 60% fewer hospitalizations overall, 40% fewer emergency room visits, and 60% fewer urgent Visit. So we said, an action plan, a self-management plan, is something that all COPD patients should have. Alphas especially should have this, because your lungs are most likely to be damaged during a flare-up. You need to start the treatment early. If you don't have an action plan, that should be your item number one to take away from today. You should have those medicines at home in the medicine cabinet right now, or even better yet, in your travel kit if you're from outside Toronto. Your doctor can actually download an action plan from the Canadian Thoracic Society website or the Canadian Lung Association website. The green area, what to take when you're well. The yellow area, step number one if you're not well. And the red area, what to do if all hell breaks loose. Quickly, a list. Uh, we like the dual bronchodilator step. That would be the middle step. Uh, here, LABAs and LAMAs mixed together. And these are once daily agents. This is something you should be looking at with your doctor. And now my list of things for patients to do. Augmentation therapy works. And it slows the progression of emphysema in alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency patients with lung disease. If your respiratory specialist has discussed this with you, and you've looked at it and gone to work on it, great. But if your doctor hasn't, I'm not sure you've got the right respiratory specialist. The current statement from the Canadian Thoracic Society says this stuff works and it needs to be considered. Only a minority of patients with COPD, and that would include alphas, benefits from inhaled steroids. So if you're taking them, you should know why. Is it because you're having frequent flare-ups? Have all the other options been explored? Is it because your disease is a bit asthma-like? You should know why, and it shouldn't just be a leftover from a prescribing tradition that's now decades out of date. And the newer inhaled agents tend to be a little bit more potent, and they're certainly at once a day, they tend to be a bit more convenient. I've got a long list of other things. This I don't really have to say to this group, but make yourself an expert. I hope it's clear to you that doctors, even lung specialists out there in Canada, don't know a lot about this relatively rare disease, so you'd better know a lot about it to push your doctors in the right direction. There are some USB keys out there. They have some information for patients and doctors. That's a good place to start. So inform your doctor. Challenge your doctor. Hey, shouldn't I have my liver function test done? Shouldn't I have an ultrasound of my liver? Go look up things and bring it back to your doctor. Keep a binder. Canadians tend to be a little bit passive about this, but those records are yours. And there's some things, by the way, that your doctor won't have quick access to. I'll point out one of them, a genotype. You know the ZZ or the SZ genotype that somebody should have measured to verify your disease? In my hospital, we have this rather elaborate electronic record. Don't get me started. <laughs> but I'll tell you that for all the alpha patients I see, all I can learn from that electronic record is the fact that the genotype was sent out. I cannot actually find the genotype laboratory report. It is a piece of paper. I keep it very carefully and I give copies to my patients and try to give copies to their, their, their referring physicians. But at the end of the day, you're wise if you keep a binder, maybe of your lung function results, a list of your medications, 
a listing of your flare-ups so you can keep track of how often they're occurring and certainly your genotype. Keep checking your augmentation therapy coverage. We've run into people who didn't have coverage and unbeknownst to them, their husband's insurance coverage got changed at work. It actually was a cheaper policy and that's why it got changed, but lo and behold, the new cheaper policy actually did cover augmentation therapy. Keep checking. Nobody else is going to do that for you. Make sure you have an action plan. I mentioned that earlier. Must, must, must have an action plan. And um, we can talk a bit about this maybe at the break, but family screening. I can't reach out to your brother or your sister, the people I'm really concerned about. Only you can. So please try and get out there and make sure that they're screened properly, which by the way is not a serum level. It's with genetic testing and you'll hear about the registry later, but we can help that uh, job get done. We can even do it, if you will, off the books. So join the registry. You'll hear a presentation later. I mentioned earlier that I was so pleased to see patients here. You're here as part of Alpha One Canada. That's the patient group. I'm glad you're a part of Alpha One Canada. Don't forget, there's another Alpha something or other out there. It's the registry. We sit there quietly and just keep a list. And if there's research you need to know about, we'll tell you about it. That's how Canada took the lead in publishing the rapid trial. I don't know if you noticed that. We are doing a great deal of game-changing research, and it's because we have a registry. So if you've joined Alpha One Canada, but nobody's bugged you once a year to send in a copy of your latest breathing test, you're not a member of the registry. And Nic I'm going to point at Nicole shortly. At that table, Nicole, find her. She'll be happy to help you sign up to the registry if you're not already there. And finally, be a squeaky wheel. I think I showed you, as much as COPD in general, may be affecting public health, it's not getting a lot of attention. This group of individuals who have this very special form of COPD need to make more noise. You need to talk to members of provincial parliament, etc., to make sure they put money where the problems are. Thank you. I was trying to run away and Angela said I had to answer questions. <laughs> Ask Sandy. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks very much for the talk. It was super informative. I wonder if you could comment on um, prophylactic antibiotics in patients who have MAC. Um, so let me translate. I, I'm sure everybody heard the question, but MAC is short for Mycobacterium avium complex. And it's a germ that's in the same family as tuberculosis, meaning that it's slow growing. But it's not tuberculosis, meaning it's not contagious. In fact, MAC is everywhere. Uh, different in different regions, and it happens to be fairly common in Ontario. And interestingly, it's more and more common in our patients with lung disease. So we're finding people who have a persistent cough, more frequent flare-ups, and if we look very carefully at an x-ray, we can find signs of some smoldering infection. That could be MAC, or sometimes the more general term is used, non-tuberculous, non-TB, mycobacteria. Um, something I didn't say about inhaled steroids is um, I said very generally that it tends to encourage infection. We now have two scientific papers out there in the literature to say that MAC and NTM infections are more common now in COPD and it's related to our use of inhaled steroids. So again, be careful about your use of inhaled steroids. There should be a very good reason to use them before you're using them daily. So the question was about prophylactic um, antibiotics, and I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm going to turn it back to you in a second, but one of the reasons I hesitate to use the daily azithromycin I was describing there is that it's one antibiotic, and over time, people develop resistance. Turns out that that azithromycin is one of our key antibiotics 
for Mac. So the last thing I want to do is give somebody daily azithromycin if it turns out that their problem is actually MAC. So before I get there with daily azithromycin, I check phlegm samples, send them off to the laboratory, make sure that I'm not dealing with MAC, and then I'd consider azithromycin. I'd also do a CT scan of the chest. So I would say I don't use preventive or prophylactic antibiotics if I know that there's MAC present. I try to treat MAC, more importantly, if it is present and important, with three or four different antibiotics. And as I suspect you know, it takes a long time. It's 18 to 24 months of treatment. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I just wondered if there was an alternative to um, Other antibiotics probably do work as preventives, and certainly biaxin, for example, is a, um, what we call a macrolide antibiotic. Uh, however, um, the macrolides are the important ones for MAC, so um, it's the same problem. I have a bunch of questions. Are you ready? No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, Somebody get this man's OHIP number. <laughs> The, the, one of the things I guess I, st my, I was doing, having a normal life, uh, doing athletics, you know, I was a pretty active person, and then I had a, an aneurysm about, ten year, about nine years ago, and then, uh, then the lung, my lung function dropped. And um, so I was just, I was curious, and it's been, it's been a constant question every time I come up, talk to a doctor, is there any research on um, the outlier effect of alpha uh, regarding aneurysms or? Um, aneurysms are something that I've heard mentioned more than once, and I am not at this time aware of a definitive study. So just to translate for the rest of the room, um, the major arteries uh, and the small arteries in the body um, get a pulse of blood, they have to be a bit elastic, and so they have elastic tissues in them. And the problem with alpha-1 is that elastase, which is normally present in the body, can uh, go unopposed and dissolve elastin. So as well as lung damage, one thought is maybe people are more prone to aneurysms. It's been talked about, I'm not aware of anything definitive, and maybe we need to pool all of our international data and registries and see if we can get a signal. Let me pause, because there are other really smart people in the room. Sandy, anything definitive? Strength in numbers, um, and and a suspicion haven't been able to prove it yet, and that's why we're asking people to share their information with us. So the that's okay. Um, <laughs> Not so loud. Yes. The most common deficiency that's referred to my office are people with low serum levels who, as it turns out, are carriers. Their risk of emphysema is very small to non-existent. Their risk of liver disease is small to non-existent, and they don't need augmentation therapy. The only way we know that they have an important deficiency is to get their genotype. So it sounds as though we should take this offline, but your next step is to make sure you know what your genotype is if it hasn't been done. So, so the, so my question is, 
you can still get your genotype tested. Maybe we should take this one offline. I have a feeling it's a very specific question, but please get your genotype tested. Um, and intravenous infusions of prolastin will not interfere with that. I'm sorry. Just give me the hook whenever or just open up the trap door. It happens all the time. First, thank you for coming, doctor. And I have a follow-up question to the lady over there about MAC. Uh, have, are you having good success with eradicating MAC from alpha patients? And is the prevalence of uh, getting MAC a, a second or third time high? Like I'm on a massive dose of uh, uh, three, three antibiotics, azithromycin, rifampin, and thambitol, but I've had MAC now for three years, and the coughing spells, like, they're like a sine curve. Like, uh, I'm, I'm just finishing up a, a run of uh, uh, prednisone, so my coughing is, until you said the word cough, it, it, it's much reduced. But uh, it's been three years now, and we had hoped that after 18 months, 24, we did. Let me give a, a, a quick answer. Yes, we generally er eradicate MAC. It does come back and it can be a real challenge. It is a chronic infection and some of the predisposing factors that created the issue in the first place are things that we can't make go away and so it may return. Um, my general advice about alpha and my advice about MAC and just about anything else you might have is look for an expert. And I've tried to say politely, even your expert lung physician may not be an expert in alpha-1. There are very few alpha-1 experts around. I don't know, uh, and again, we could take this offline, there are NTM experts around in this country. I work next door to a couple of them, and you're describing a good basic regimen for MAC, but if it's problematic, there are other agents available, other strategies available, and you might want to talk to somebody who spends a whole lot of time dealing with MAC. Uh, just as you uh, said that uh, not all lung doctors know much about this uh, problem, I'm wondering how many radiologists know how to measure lung density and um, how, how this goes uh, in the general radiologic community. Thanks for that question. Um, as we talk about lung density, you would expect doctors to start using it clinically, and actually we don't. Uh, the lung density measurements in the rapid trial and follow-on trials is done very specifically following a specific protocol and calibrating the equipment with something called a phantom, which sounds appropriately Halloweenish, but it's a, a, a standard model that gives us some numbers. More and more CT scanners do better and better things, and many of them will generate a number that's called lung density. But it isn't going to be a firm number of the sort that we used in RAPID. So the succinct answer to your question, having blathered on, is doctors don't have good access to reliable lung density numbers with radiology in the general community. It may be coming, but it's not there yet. For day-to-day -day clinical purposes, the FEV1 and other lung function measurements, probably more than FEV1, are the things that doctors follow. And as much as it's not terribly sensitive, we do have a sense of what it means. This is mild, this is severe, this is changing rapidly, this is changing slowly. Um, so lung function measurements remain what we track most of all. But we do get more CT scans, for example, <clears throat> as a baseline, trying to decide what's going on with somebody and is now the time to start. But it's more of a visual, qualitative, gosh, that looks kind of dark and low density. Maybe we should be starting now, not sharply uh, defined by numbers. And I think I really did get the hook there. Thank you. Okay.